We say first and foremost that we say we seek refuge in Allah for the law from Shaitan the accursed. We know and we must believe that Shaitan is the God enemy of mankind. So we seek refuge in Allah for the law from him. We say Bismillah Rahman Rahim. We say in the name of Allah, the most merciful and most merciful of God. For we do everything by his permission. So we say in the name of Allah, the most gracious and most merciful. Truly and verily, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him and seek only His help and forgiveness. For truly to ask for forgiveness of Allah, but Allah, or to ask for forgiveness is a part of one's ibadah. It's a part of one's faith. So truly, all uh, asking or all du'as or all, all seeking of forgiveness is only for Allah, but Allah. Those from Allah, but Allah, we are to be guided to Islam. No one can lead them astray. For truly to be guided to Islam, to submit sincerely, is only by the permission and by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will to be uh, guided, no one can lead astray. And those from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will to be led astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but the one God, the unseen God. I bear witness that there is no God but He, the one God, Allah, who has no partners, and I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is his slave and his messenger, Ahmad. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith that there is the best speech, the best hadith, or the best speech, the best narration, is the speech of Allah, meaning the kitab of Allah, or meaning the Quran, His word, and the best guidance, the best example, the best thing to follow, the best thing to even try to emulate is the example or the way or the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And the worst of all matters are all those things that are innovated by the people. For all innovation leads to bid'ah, and all bid'ah leads to dalala, and all dalala is in the law, which is the fire. So we ask the law of the law earnestly, that is the Surat al Mustaqeen. And what is the Surat al Mustaqeen? It is the path of Islam that is headed, that is the spirit, and it is guided by the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. We talked briefly about Adam and Eve, Iblis. We talked about Shaitan. We talked about the jinn. We talked about magic. We talked about Babylon. We talked about Islam on Friday in the Juma, We talked about what does it mean to be a Muslim? What does it mean to be in the religion of Al-Islam or the religion of submission? We talked about these things. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said in Hadith. This is a very well known Hadith, although it is very well known and it's said by many. If we really uh, analyze or break down this Hadith, it has many uh, wisdom, many um, uh, uh, wisdom in it, if we were known. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in hadith that Islam is built on five. Again, we're talking about Islam, the religion of Islam, and what does it mean to be a Muslim. So again, speaking about Islam and being Muslim, we talk about the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said Islam is built on five, five pillars or five columns, things that hold up the house. He said Islam is built on five pillars. If you have one of these pillars and they are not off of this house or they're not underneath, from underneath this house, then the whole house falls. So we have five pillars in Islam but according to the Sharia, according to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that if one of these requirements or one of these pillars are not uh, fulfilled or even believed in, 
then one will fall out of the realm of Islam, or that pillar, if it is gone, then the holding of that house is gone, and thus Islam is gone from that person. So what are the five pillars in Islam? The Prophet Muhammad says this what the five pillars are. The first pillar of Islam is the Shahada. The Shahada. To testify or to bear witness. The Shahada has two parts, which we're going to get into in a minute, because that's basically the basis of today. But we're going to go over quickly the first, the five pillars and what are they? Inshallah, we're going to break down or go over the first pillar, which is the Shahada. Again, the first pillar of Islam is the Shahada, and it is broke into two parts. The first part is, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness. I am calling to account. I am declaring in front of all of mankind, in front of Allah, in front of the jinn, in front of the Muslims, in front of the Munafikin, in front of the Malaika, in front of everybody. I am very witness that there is no God but the God Allah. You have negation and you have affirmation in this declaration. La ilaha illallah. No, but yes. I bear witness that there is no God except illa illallah, except the God. So the first part of this uh, shahada, la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is no God but the God. For value, the word Allah means the God. When it has Aleph Lamb in the beginning, it means definiteness. It means the God, the one and only God. This is the first part. La ilaha illallah. And the second part of the Shahada is Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We say something upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says the Quran that the Malaika, that they make something upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are told in Hadith that whenever we hear the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's name, that we should make something upon him. And there are multiple barakahs. There are multiple blessings that come with making sully upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We're told in Hadith that one of the barakahs is to be forgiven of a certain amount of sins, ten, ten deeds or ten sins. One is forgiven of ten sins. He is elevated ten degrees into the Jannah, inshallah, by making sully upon the Prophet. We're also told that after the Adhan, the one who makes sully upon the Prophet. And ask Allah for the Lord to give the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa wasila and fadila that the shafa'ah, the, the, the intercession by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will become mandatory, become uh, mandatory for him to intercede for the one who does uh, the salih on the Prophet. So just a reminder, again, the second point is Ashhadu anna Muhammadin abduhu wa rasulu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a slave and messenger. This is the second part of the Shahada. Very important because there is not one without the other. You cannot have La ilaha Allah without Muhammad Rasulullah. You cannot have Muhammad Rasulullah without La ilaha Allah. You cannot have the Quran without reading the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad or the Hadith, you cannot read the Hadith without reading the Quran, for they go together. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said the Hadith, that barely I leave you two things, two things that if you hold fast to them you will never go astray, the Quran and my Sunnah. So the Book of Allah, the Word of Allah, and the Sunnah. In another Hadith, again, the Quran and the Sunnah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in hadith, he said, obey your emirs, obey your emirs, even if he is an Abyssinian slave. Obey your emirs, even if he is an Abyssinian slave. 
with the head like a raisin or a mutilated nose. Obey him if he is enjoining by the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We must obey him, right? And he said, and follow the ways, the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the ways of the rightly guided caliphs, and bite down to that which are morality, and beware of bid'ah. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said to follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to follow his sunnah, to follow the way of the rightly guided caliphs, and to bite down with your loyalty, to hold fast to this, and beware of bid'ah. Another hadith about holding fast to the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said in hadith that verily in the last days to hold on to the sunnah or to follow the sunnah or to be able to be a those who are counted among those who follow the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that it will be harder, it will be like holding on to a hot burning coal. That would be the, uh, the comparison of trying to hold on to the sunnah in the last days as we see today. It would be comparative to holding on to a hot burning coal. Now we know a hot burning coal, don't nobody want to touch that hot potato. Hot! It's hot. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that the same way that we wish not to touch this hot potato or this hot burning coal, it's the same way in the last days that it would be hard to hold on to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This will be a task that will be hard. This will be a task that will be hard only for those who are not blessed with Imam. This will be hard only for those who don't fear the loss of Allah. But those who fear the loss of Allah, it will not be hard. It will be easy. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Hadith, that you will not believe unless your instinct is the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You do not believe unless your instinct, your natural inclination, everything about you, your do's, your don'ts, your discipline, the way that you listen, the way that you comprehend, the way that you give respect. If it's not according to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you truly do not have Iman yet. For Iman is that your inclination, your instinct, is the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, we just talking briefly about the five pillars of Islam. And we have five of them, but briefly we're going to talk today about the first pillar. But let's talk about the five pillars first. The first pillar is the Shahada. It says we bear witness or we declare in the form of Allah in front of mankind that we bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one God who has no partners. And we bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Qurayshi, that he was the Qatam al Nabi, that he was the seed of the prophets, that he was the seed of the messengers, and that he was the last of the prophets. The second pillar of Islam is the Salah, or the prayer. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the criterion between the disbeliever and the Muslim, the criterion, the furqan, the thing that establishes belief or kufr is the prayer. The one who does the prayer, then that is a witness for him. The one who doesn't do the prayer, that is a witness for him. We're told by many of the scholars that particularly one of the uh, scholars, uh, Imam Ahmed, who declared that a man who did not make his salat, that he is kufr, that he is a disbeliever based on the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are other, the other hadith and other scholars who say that the punishment for one who doesn't do his salat, that he should be uh, imprisoned. Some even say that there are uh, ten lashes. Because in Islam, we have what is called ta'zir, and what we have is called hudud. 
who do are the things that are prescribed by Allah for the law with specific punishments, 40 lashes, 80 lashes, 100 lashes. But if there is something that is, that is not specifically uh, prescribed by Allah for the, law, the Prophet Muhammad the, 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 uh, the most that you can do is 10 lashes. This is called ta'zir. So again, the second pill of Islam is the Salah. The Prophet Muhammad said that it is ordained upon the Muslims. It is ordained upon the Muslims, men and women, that they make the Salah five times a day. Five of them. Juma. For the man, it is, it is death. It is required. And it is possible to do his prayer in Jama'ah, in congregation. Allah subhanahu says that it is mandatory for the man to akim a salah. It is mandatory for the man to establish a prayer not only within himself, but his whole household. It is not enough for one to just do the salah by himself. If he has a wife, if he has kids, if there's anyone who is visiting in his house, if he is the man of the house, if he is the husband of the house, it is mandatory that he akim a salah. It is his responsibility to establish the prayer in the house, to make sure everyone does the wudu in the house, to make sure that everyone does their five prayers in the house. This is akim a salah. If the man, if the husband, if he does not enjoy the salah or his family members, and even though he does the salat himself, he has not established the salat, and his salat is deficient, as stated by Imam Bukhari with the definition of Akima Salat. If a man is in his home, and he has a wife, and he makes salat, but he does not make her do salat, he does not enjoy the salat on his wife, then he has not made salat. He will be questioned by Allah for the law and the dead judgment. Why did he not establish Salah? If a man has children in his home and he does not, and he makes Salah, but yet he does not make Salah or he does not enjoy the Salah on his kids, he makes Salah by himself while the kids are playing video games or the kids are outside, then he has not established Salah. He has not fulfilled the requirements of doing the Salah. Allah says, Akima Salah. Akima Salah means that you establish the prayer. You lay down the foundation. You make it happen. You establish it. You set the times in your house. You set the precedent in your house. You set the precedent of wudu. You set the precedent of the bond in the house. You set the precedence of Fajr. You set the precedence of Isha. You set the precedence of Stinja. These are the things that are required to Akim a Salah. The third prayer, the third, uh, the third pillar in Islam. The third pillar of Islam is Zakat. Zakat means to purify. And when we're talking about the Zakat, Allah talks about the purifying of one's money. <coughs> Zakat means to purify one's money or one's funds. For Allah from the law has enjoyed upon us the establishment of society and the, the safekeeping or the welfare of society. So therefore he establishes a certain structure a certain system so that we may be able to function uh, properly in society. <coughs> Allah says in the Quran that it is He that gives people wealth, it is He that makes people employers, and it is He that makes people that are employees. Allah says that it is Him, it is He that made this Nizan. It is Him that made this balance. So there's nothing wrong with being one who works or being a boss. There's nothing wrong with being a boss or being an employee. 
Allah said that He did this, that He made this in order to test us. Because the boss, surely he or she will be tested as to their etiquette with their employee. And the employee, he will be tested as to his etiquette and his mannerisms with the boss and that business or whatever else goes on with it. Everything is a test. But with regards to the to money or the zakat, Allah subhanahu calls it zakat because the word zakat means to purify. When you purify your money, and we look up to the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, that if you fulfill your requirement of zakat, if you fulfill your requirement of zakat, which is paid only once a year, which we'll get into, he said that he will have no questioning as to the rest of your money. As long as you fulfill your obligation of zakat, then you can do whatever else that you want to do with your money. You can explode it, you can spin it, you can save it, but the main thing is that you fulfill the requirement of the zakat. Now what is the zakat? The zakat is paid once a year. Once a year, two and a half percent of what we call uh, monies. But it even goes even deeper into that, it goes into the gold, the silver, if you have crops, if you have fruits, if you have gold, if you have commodities, if you have oil, if you have certain things in your store that have certain about, uh, uh, value. All of this is accumulated in your zakat. Zakat is not just paper money. That is not zakat. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was giving the khutbah for the Eid, he ordered Balaw radiallahu an to go collect the zakat for the women. And he said they started taking off their rings and their jewelry and started putting it in a blanket to show that this too was part of zakat. There's also, if you read uh, the thick books, uh, the Muwatta of Imam Malik, it goes very uh, in depth into the zakat with regard to the crops, the water, the dates, right? But whatever thing that you have that has value, you have to pay the zakat on it. And it's the whole thing. Something is 10%, something is 20%. You have to look it up and read it. Especially if you have a business or you have a lot of money or you have property, then you must look into it because there's zakat on all of these things as well. Okay, so we have the shahada, we have the salah, we have the zakat. The fourth uh, pillar of Islam, and again the fourth and the fifth, they can be intertwined depending on what hadith you read. But the fourth pillar of Islam we have is saum, which is saum, saum or shahra Ramadan, which is fasting in the month of Ramadan. For Muslims, it is mandatory, it is wajib, it is formed, it is something that is ordained by Allah subhanahu wa that we fast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, He says that fasting has been prescribed for you, as it, as it, it has been prescribed to those before you, so that you may obtain taqwa. So Allah is going to say in the Quran that He ordained fasting. Not only did He ordain fasting for us, but it is something that has been ordained before us. So it's something that is not new. It's something that has been done before. So He said fasting has been ordained for you. It has been made mandatory upon you. Kutiba alaykum. Kutiba alaykum means that it has been prescribed, it has been written, and it has been ordained. Kutiba alaykum siyam, as-siyam. Okay? It's prescribed. So, Allah said this is something that is mandatory. For every well-bodied man or female that reaches the age of uh, discernment, it is mandatory that they fast from sun up to sundown. 
Okay, and during this time, there's certain prerequisites, uh, watching what you hear, watching what you say, so forth and so on. The last pillar of Islam, or the fifth pillar of Islam is Hajj. Hajj to the base of Allah. Making the pilgrimage to the house of Allah, which is the Kaaba in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. The Prophet Muhammad said so that it is mandatory for every Muslim, man, female, that has the ability, financially able, that when they are financially able, that it is mandatory that they make a trip to Mecca, Saudi Arabia, to the Kaaba. Now this Kaaba is the same Kaaba that was built by Abraham السلام, and his son Ishmael السلام, many years ago. Allah said that this is prosperous, this is something that is ordained, and this is something that we must do. Very important. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith that if you want to travel, if you want to travel somewhere, if you were to travel, in one hadith he said, go fight jihad. You want to go travel, then go fight jihad. In another hadith, talking about traveling, that if you have the ability to travel, the first place you better go is to the Kaaba or Mecca. Before you make that trip to France, before you make that trip to Mexico, before you make that trip to the Caribbean or the Bahamas, or you say you have to take that little uh, trip to wherever it is that you decided to go, you better make sure that you have made your or fulfilled your obligation of Hodge first before you would spend that money on that other trip. Because if you die before you made Hodge and you did a trip somewhere else other than Hodge, then surely you would be held accountable for that. Because the first obligation that you have when you have the ability to travel, and again there's prerequisites, before you make high, you must have no debts. You must have no debts. After you get free, then you make high. But if you have debt, then it, your high is not accepted because you must be debt free. But once you're debt free and your finance is up to par, then it becomes incumbent upon you to make the high. Okay? So these are the five pillars. Shahada, Salah, Zakah, Saum, and Hajj, which is the Shahada, bearing witness that there is no God but Allah, and bearing witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, from Allah, the Lord, the the Messenger, the Salah, which is the prayer for the Muslim five times a day, it is incumbent upon the Muslim that he prays five times a day, which we're going to talk about another day on this pillar. And the third thing is zakat, zakat which is the purifying of one's money or one's mind or falus. And this is a coming upon a Muslim once a year, two and a half for six. Now understand that there's a difference between zakat and sadaqa. Zakat and sadaqa, there's two different things. Zakat is wajib. Sadaqa is not. Sadaqa is nawasim. It's something that you can just do uh, charity. It's something that's voluntary, but it's something that is good. Okay? Anything that you do, do good, then the waffle and the waffle you multiply it 10 times to 700 times. Okay? Zakah is mandatory once a year, preferably paid during Ramadan. Okay? Before, um, before, uh, during Ramadan, but before the end of it. Because there's two kinds of zakat. There's zakat al and zakat al which is a whole other subject. But they're two different things. But the zakat should be paid once a year, two and a half percent. And, but we'll talk about that. But there's another thing about the, uh, the misad, which is the minimum for the zakat, that if you have a bare minimum, we'll say $500, or there's a certain kind of misad, which if your money goes below this Nisad, this five hundred, six hundred dollars. If your money goes below this five hundred, six hundred dollars throughout the year and you did not uh, obtain this Nisad for a whole year, because the car 
is only raised on something for a year that you had for a year. Now I could have five thousand at one time, then it goes to two thousand, then it might go to fifty thousand, then it might go below, then it might go to a hundred dollars, right? The zakat is raised on whatever you had for that whole year solid. So if I went below the Nisad, then I don't have to pay the top. But that's a whole other subject. Okay? The next pillar of Islam is the Shahr Ramadan, which is uh, fasting during the month of Ramadan. This is incumbent upon every Muslim. It's not during the month of December. As the Nation of Islam, they fast during the month of December every year. Uh, this is a bid'ah. Um, this is something that we don't do. We, you know, we follow the Hilal. We follow the, the crescent in the moon. And every year, you know, Ramadan moves. When I first became Muslim, Ramadan was in March. Now it's all the way in July. So it moves. In fact, it's really about 360 days compared to the 365 of the secular Roman Greco calendar. In Islam, we have 360 days. So, it is, incum it is incumbent upon us. It is incumbent upon us. So, back to the, the first pillar of The first pillar of Islam is Shahada. Even though this is the first pillar of Islam, and we say it all the time, we say, Man, and Allah, Muhammad, and Rasulullah, we say this over and over again. We say it out of our mouth, we have our kids say it. We like saying it. It sounds good. You know, it makes it sound like we know another language. But when we say la ilaha illallah, it means something. When we say shahada, which is the first pillar, this is the thing, the first pillar, and this is the main pillar in which Islam stands upon. Because remember, without one of these pillars, you have no Islam. If I knock out one of those legs of that chair, that chair is going to fall. I knock out one of the legs or the pillars or the columns of Islam, the whole house of Islam falls. You heard of the story of uh, Samson. He was so powerful and strong and he knocked out the pillars. And the whole house came down. Same thing in Islam. You knock down any one of the pillars. And we're going to talk about the first pillar. And the whole house of Islam falls. The first pillar. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulullah, Tawheed, and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Shahada, you declare Tawheed, and you declare that you follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La ilaha illallah. I bear witness. I call to account. I proclaim that there is no God except Allah. In that declaration that we talked about in the khutbah on Friday, everybody bore witness to Allah for the law that Allah is our Rabb. We already bore witness to that. We already said that Allah for the law is our Rabb. We already bore witness to that. We already said that Sharab Allah is Allah. We already said that. It's in the Quran. So we say, La ilaha illallah, we bear witness that there is no God but Allah. When we say that, we are saying that we understand that the one that created us, we understand that the one that is on his throne, we understand that we are accountable for our actions and are living here on this earth. We understand that the one that created all of this is watching us. He created the heavens and the earth in six days. Then he established his throne. This is the loss for the law. He is on his throne, unseen. Aisha bin Anha, she said, if anyone says, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Allah on the day of Mi'raj, on Isra, when he went to go ascend to the heavens. If anyone says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Allah, they are a liar. 
For all the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said that he saw, he said, Nur ala Nur, Nur ala Nur, light upon light. When he ascended to the heavens, and he had his conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the proclamation of the prayers was established. And Allah talked to him. He said he saw Nur ala Nur. Another example. Musa alayhi salam, Moses alayhi salam. We're told in the Torah. We're told in the Old Testament. We're told in the Quran that Moses alayhi salam that he asked to see Allah. He said, Ya Allah, can I see you? So Allah told Musa alayhi salam, he said, look at those mountains. Look at those mountains. I'm going to show my countenance. I'm going to show my glory to these mountains. And it says in the scripture, and it says in the hadith, it says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jalla Jalalahu. When he showed his magnificence, when he showed his uh, his magnitude, when he showed his glory to the mountains, he said that the mountain blew up. Boom! The mountain blew up, and yet Musa alayhi salam was not unconscious. Boom! And he says in the hadith that when Musa alayhi salam, when he gained his consciousness. When he was brought back into his senses after being knocked out silly, he said, Glory be to thee, Ya Allah, if you do not forgive me for asking too many questions, for challenging you, for testing you, then surely I will be of the wrong in me. I will be of the wrongdoers. So Allah subhanahu wa told Musa alayhi salam, this is to show you that verily no man can see God and live. No man can see God and live. This is in the Torah. This is in the book of Deuteronomy. In the old book of the Christians. No man can see God and live. Same thing in the Quran. No man can see God and live. For God is a God that is unseen. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in hadith, who Allah talks in the Quran about thousand abeen, the thousand abeen, the ultimate achievement or the ultimate reward. It talks about those who fight in the cause of Allah, qatilu fi sabilillah, wa qutilu wa qatilu, they fight, they kill and are killed. But he talks about thousand abeen, the great achievement. The Prophet Muhammad said that even though the people that entered into the Jannah, they will have everything that their heart desires. But Allah will show the what He will show His face. Now, before we get into that, Allah says His face, His what? But again, we must remember Laysa Kamitli. Laysa Kamitli He shaped. There is nothing like unto Him. So even though he says the face of Allah, it is not like the face our face. It's not like the human face. It's not like a face that you can comprehend. The Prophet Muhammad said in the hadith, whatever you can think of, that is not Allah. And whatever you think of, that's not him. And if you think of something else, that's not him. Your mind can't even comprehend what Allah looks like. That's not him. Don't even think about it because you can't do it. The more you try, you'll make your brain pop. Because <laughs> you can't go, what is he under? You can't do it, that's not him. So, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha lillahu anha, Musa alayhi salam, even Ibrahim alayhi salam, because we're told in the Quran that he even asked for a test. Everyone wanted a test. But the main test for the main ayat that Allah for the law is real. It's in our nafs. We know it. Allah said that He made it in our fitrah. It's in our fitrah. 
It's in our natural inclination that we know that a loss of the law is real. We know that we were created to be tested. We know that there's something greater out there than just us. The same way we look down at the ants on the ground, surely there was something bigger than us that's looking down at us and watching us. So the same way we watch that ant farm or that ant, wherever that ant farm, and we look at it like, oh, look at those little ants. Look at them. I can just step on them. The same way that we look at those little ants and we can step on them very easily and they can't stop us. The same way that we are those little ants to the law for Allah. We are those little ants that walk upon this little earth like little ants and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watching us just being busy on his earth. Keep that in mind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la ilaha The first aspect of this deen that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa taught or he uh, advised to teach first. One of the Sahabas, Mu'az ibn Jabal, Mu'az ibn Jabal, he came and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught him the deen. And he said, Ya Mu'az, because he was sending him to Yemen to go teach the people the deen. And he said, Ya Mu'az, what will you teach the people? What will be the first thing that you teach the people when you get to Yemen? He said, Ya Rasulullah, the first thing I will teach them will be about Tawheed. And after they have a firm understanding of Tawheed, then I will teach them about their obligation of the Salat. Once they have a firm understanding of the Salat, then I will teach them about their obligation of the Zakat, and then so forth and so on. The Prophet Muhammad gave his affirmation or his agreement or like, yes, that's it. So he gave us a prerequisite and a formula or a foundation on how we are supposed to advocate this deed. This deed is not something that we just make up and we do what we want to do. Even for the new Shahada that, take this, that come to this deed, there is a precedence, there is a sunnah, in what is supposed to be done with the new Muslims. This is what I was taught. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever somebody was brought into the deen, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appointed someone to teach them the deen. Appointed someone to teach them the deen. There's no such thing as new straggling Muslims in this deen. This was something that was unheard of in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that anyone who calls someone to this deen, anyone who calls to this deen, says come to Laila Allah, come to Al-Islam, and they accept the deen by the decree of Allah and by your works that Allah decreed for you at. Allah said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that anyone who calls someone to this deen and they accept this deen is better than the world and everything in it. Just calling someone to the deen and they accept the deen by your works, by your dawah, by your example, or because they saw you, they saw how you moved, they saw how you got down, they saw the things that you did, the things that you didn't do, or because you gave them some books, you gave them some literature, you gave them some dawah. And because of these works, and because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because first of all, Allah got a God. But if they come to the deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it is better than the world and everything in it. So surely, <laughs> as those who have been blessed or gifted with this deen of Islam, it is our responsibility first and foremost to stand firm on this deen as Muslims with that badge of honor and understand that then we are the best for mankind. So if anybody deserves to be able to pop their collar, it should be the Muslim. I'm the best of mankind around here. 
Why? Because Allah says because you believe in Allah in the last day and you enjoy the right and you forbid the wrong. So surely I'm going to be the best of mankind if I fulfill those obligations and prerequisites of the things that require me to be the best of mankind. Believing in Allah, believing in the last day, enjoying the right, forbidding the wrong. Best. And will be the best and will require all and will obtain all of the best sustenance and blessings if we do those things. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith that surely everything that you ask for, anything that you make dua for, he says surely he has promised to give it to you. Whatever you ask for, any dua that you make, he said he'll give it to you. The only thing that hinders it, procrastinates it, or delays it from coming to you is our own sins. He said that he has decreed it, that whatever my evad, whatever my slave, whatever he asks for, I will give it to him. But the only thing that hinders it, procrastinates it, or doesn't allow you to obtain it, is that one person's own sins. So the only thing holding us back from greatness, or the only thing holding us back from falah, which is success, is ourselves. Is ourselves. If we strive to be of the foremost in this being, or we say we want to be the foremost in this being, or we say we want the firdaus, we want the jannah, we want the highest part, we want to be in the body of the green birds. We want to be at the shuhada. We don't want to feel death. We want Hurin Ain. We want the 72 wives with us. We want all of these things. We say we want these things. He be oh, I, I want it. But do we work for it? Everybody ain't going to get it. You have to work for it. Allah says in the Quran, and race one another. Race one another towards good deeds. Race one another towards the Jannah, whose space is wide. Race. This is the competition to see who's going to be first, who's going to be the Sabi King, who's going to be foremost in this being. The Prophet Muhammad said that the Jannah has seven layers. There's seven layers of the Jannah. And according to your faith, according to your Iman, based on your deeds, it will determine what level of Jannah that you'll be in. Right? Everyone ain't going to be on the same level. Everyone won't attain the same blessings. Everyone won't attain the same trees, the same houses, the same blessings. No. For sure to be told in Hadith that the Muslim, he'll have a long neck on the day of judgment. He'll have a long neck. It didn't say everybody will have a long neck. He said the Muslim, he'll have a long neck. Another Hadith that said the Shuhada, they'll come on the day of judgment with crowns, with rubies on their head. Not everybody, but the Shuhada. They'll be on the day of judgment with crowns on their head, with rubies and emeralds. And wherever the wound, it will come, it will come out like musk. He didn't say everybody. He said the shuhada. Then you have Ashab Yamin. Then you have the people that, uh, the people that will enter the certain doors of the those who fasted or those who there's different levels. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that even in the Jannah there's a hundred levels <coughs> that don't nobody go except the Mujahideen. There's a hundred levels that each the Mujahideen only. To, only specifically for the Mujahideen. Therefore, everybody ain't going there. Everybody ain't going there. They get the highest. So again, Iman, Allah from the law, La ilaha illallah, Tawheed, Muhammad is the Father. The first thing that he taught was Tawheed. The first thing that the Prophet Muhammad said to teach was Tawheed. The first thing that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught was Tawheed. For 13 years, in his 23 year 
uh, prophetic span. 13 years of those 23 were Kali. Before the Hudus, before the Sharia, before the do's and the don'ts, right? Before they even had an Islamic country or an Islamic structure or an Islamic front, such as Medina. 13 years of Ta'eed. Land of Allah. And the reason why Tawi was so much emphasized because the Prophet Allah says in the Quran that surely he forgives all sins except shirk. He will forgive all sins except shirk to whom he wills. So surely Tawi is the main emphasis because if you do not have a firm understanding a firm grasp on the understanding of Tawheed. What does it mean to fear Allah? What does it mean that He is the only authority? What does it mean that I put to walk to Allah? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. What does it mean I put my trust in Allah and that there is no might and no power but Allah? What does it mean? Tawheed. All this is Tawheed. The first aspect or the three aspects of Tawheed. The first aspect of Tawheed, Tawheed Tawheed Uluhiya. Tawheed Uluhiya. It is the declaration of Allah's oneness in His Godship. Tawheed Uluhiya. Uluhiya comes from the word Ilaha. Tawheed Uluhiya. The oneness in God. Uh, the one is, it is Godship. When we say La ilaha illallah, we say that there is only one God. We don't worship no other gods. We say that the same God that created everything, this is the only person that we worship. This is the only person that we turn to. This is the only person that we ask things for. And this is the only person that we understand is in control of all things. This brings us to Tawhid al-Rububiya. Tawhid al-Rububiya, the one that's in his lordship. We understand that he is the only one that is the sustainer of all things. He is the only one that is in control of all things. He is the one on the day of judgment. He is Malik al-Yawmuddin. He is the king, the authority on the day of judgment. The day that no one else will be able to talk. The day when People will be determined whether they're going to heaven and hell. It is He, Allah, the only one that will be able to determine where people are going. The only one that does not die. The only one that has the ability to create Allah. In Islam, we have also Tawhid al-Asma wa Sifat. We believe in the oneness of His names and His attributes. We have Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. It is the oneness of his name and his attributes. Such as we say, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, Al-Ghafur, Al-Wadud, Al-Wali, Al-Awwal, right? These are names of Allah for the law. These are his names, these are his attributes, and we believe in them. To deny an attribute of Allah for the law is kufr. To deny an attribute of Allah for the law is kufr. So when Allah for the says the face of Allah, we say we believe in the face of Allah, although it is not like the face of mankind. Right? We understand he said face, we understand he said hand, 
We understand that he says shin. We understand that it says that he smiles, but it's not like us. Like the commission he shaped. There's nothing like unto him. We must understand and believe that Allah for the law as Muslims. Again, part of Tawheed. This is the part of the Aqidah. We do not believe that Allah for the law is everywhere. He's not everywhere. He's with us everywhere. He's in me. No, he's not in you. Allah for the law is on his throne. Allah for the law says, He is on his throne. Okay? He's with us everywhere in knowledge, but he is on his throne. In the fiqh, it is stated that to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on his throne, or to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on the arsh, that this is a part of one's aqidah. To deny this fact, to say that God is anywhere other than on his throne, to say that God is in me, to say that God is anywhere, to say that he is in the bathroom, this is shirk. Allah is on his throne. He is too holy to be in me. He is too holy to even be seen. As we said earlier with Musa as stated earlier by the statement of Aisha bin Allah Anha. Nur ala Nur. That's all we saw. So no one can see God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on his throne. There was a hadith where in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a slave woman, and I think she was an African slave. But she was a slave woman, and she was presented to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And actually, if my memory uh, is correct, uh, this slave woman, she was being treated badly by her slave owner. And somehow they came back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked her, he asked her, where is Allah? First and foremost, he asked her, who am I? And she said, you're Rasulullah. You're the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she said, and he asked her, where is Allah? And she pointed to the sky, she said, this man in the sky, or on the earth, on his throne. Based on these statements, based on the statement that he was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and based on the statement that she said that Allah is in the earth, or in the, in the, in the, uh, excuse me, in the, in the sama, in the earth, I mean, excuse me, in the heavens, i.e. in the earth, on his throne, based on his statement, he stated that she is a believer, she is of the Mu'minah, and to let her go free. So this woman was a slave. But after the Prophet Muhammad asked her, Who am I? And she said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he asked her, Where is Allah? And she pointed to the sky. Right? She said on his throne, or in the heavens. He said, Let her go. Let her go free. For she is a believer. So to believe that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we already know. So to believe that he is Rasulullah, that he is the Messenger of Allah, this is faith. And to believe that the Allah with Allah is on his arms in the throne, this is also a part of faith. This is also a part of Aqidah. Abu Hanifa, one of the four uh, Imams. Stating, anyone who does not believe that Allah for the law is on his throne is a kufr, is out of the realm of Islam, for this is a part of the Akira to believe that Allah for the law is on his arsh, however he deems fit. <coughs> also, in Islam, part of Tawhid, in Islam, we don't believe in superstitions. We don't believe in uh, rabbit foots, lucky rabbit foots, uh, lucky horseshoes. Uh, we don't believe in 40 clovers. We don't believe in uh, walking on the crack and break the back. 
We don't believe in splitting the pole and all this other stuff. We don't believe in uh, walking inside with the umbrella, breaking the glass. That is a law in Islam. To believe in these superstitions, to believe that something or anything or someone has the power or authority to alter something in the future. Other than Allah, for the law, this is shirk. To believe that anyone or anything, such as a rabbit foot, such as my lucky belt, my lucky hat, or I'm going to wear this chain, and it has verses on the Quran, and it's going to protect me. Nothing protects you except Allah, for the law. The Prophet Muhammad said that if you wear any type of amulet or any type of chain and you believe that this thing protects you, you will be left to this thing and you have committed shirk. So in Islam, we don't believe in radish books. We don't believe in talismans. We don't believe in wearing things that will protect us. For Allah Subhanahu said that he is the protector. He is the wali. He is the protector. Allah says that verily the wali is verily the protector, the defender of the believers is Allah, the prophet, and the believers. So the only one that we need to help us or protect us is Allah for the law. For he is the wali. He is the wali. He is the protector. Okay? Only Allah for the law is the protector. In Islam, again, Tawi. In Islam, the Prophet Muhammad said, anyone who goes to a fortune teller, a soothsayer, a palm reader, and believes what that person told him or her, they have committed shirk. They have disbelieved in what the Prophet Muhammad brought and their prayers are not accepted for 40 days. Again, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith. And again, the Prophet Muhammad taught Tawheed for 23 years because the same way the Qurayshi, the same way they had a bunch of shirts, they had a bunch of idol worship, they had a bunch of prostitution, they had a bunch of gang wars going on. Everything that was going on in the drop of the Prophet Muhammad so so, is going on right here in Fresno, California. They had war houses. They had prostitution. They was gang banging. They was killing the women. They was killing the, uh, the, they was killing the, 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 the child. <laughs> they was doing everything under the sun. They was drinking. They was war mongers. Tribalism. Everything. In the time of Rasulullah sallallahu it's happening now. So the same way that Islam brought about a change for the creation, the same way that Islam could bring about a change for the indigenous, not just African Americans, but Latin Americans, Asian Americans, or even the Caucasian Americans that accept this flower because surely everyone is duped. Everyone has been duped. Not just the African American, not just the uh, Latino or the Mexican, not just the Asian, but everybody, white, black, brown, Asian, persuasion, Caucasian, everyone has been duped by, by Shaitan. And there's only a lot of people that can guide them back to Islam. Now back to Tawheed. No horoscopes. No fortune telling. No soothsaying. No palm reading. Anyone that goes to these things, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that his prayer or her prayer <coughs> it will not be accepted for 40 days and they have committed shirk and they have denied and they have disbelieved in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu also said about astrology. We don't believe in uh, astrology and looking into the stars and the constellations. I'm a Cancer, I'm a Libra, I'm a... We don't believe in that. 
You're not supposed to believe in that. Although in this culture, we get caught up in it. Well, what's your sign? What's your sign? We get caught up in that. What's your sign? Well, like, oh, you must be like that. You must be. We, we got so caught up in it that it has become the norm that we want to go straight to that newspaper. We go straight to that mouse or straight to whatever app that is on your phone or whatever it is to see or what they say about me today. What's going to happen to me today? What they say I'm going to do? What my career look like? What the, I'm gonna meet, am I going to meet somebody? And you are at the whim or you are allowing some person or some computer or whatever it may be or some gym to tell you what's going to happen to you tomorrow, what's going to happen to you next. This is sure. A lot of people are saying in the Quran that no one knows tomorrow. No one knows what's going to happen except tomorrow, except Allah. The only one that has knowledge of what's going to happen tomorrow is Allah for Allah. Even Allah says in the Quran, if you're not saying that you're going to do such and such tomorrow without saying, without saying inshallah, you don't even know if you're going to make it tomorrow. Okay? <clears throat> only Allah knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Not no soothsayer, even though the Prophet of Muhammad some of them said that some of that stuff is true because they deal with magic. The soothsayers, the palm readers, they get, they, they get their information, the kahims. They get their information from the jinn. They get their information from the jinn. The Prophet Muhammad some of them said in the hadith, because they came to the Prophet Muhammad some of them, they were talking about magic and they were talking about the jinn. And they said, but yeah, Rasulullah, because he was talking about not going to the soothsayers and not going to these people. So, they say, but Ya Rasulullah, but sometimes they tell us something, and it's true. So then he explained to them how these, uh, Sue said, how they get the information. So he said, the jinn, again, this is something that we must believe in, the jinn, they're real, they're here. It's a whole other species. That these jinn, that they stack on top of one another until they get to the lowest heavens. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees a certain matter, the angels, they flap their wings and it makes a sound as if there's chains being dragged on the ground. So they make this loud noise when their wings are flapping. <laughs> because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed something or he has said something that's going to happen, he has decreed something. So the angels, they are flapping their wings with this information. <laughs> And it says that the jinn, they eavesdrop into the heavens. They eavesdrop into some of the things that Allah subhanahu wa has decreed that's going to happen, that he said is going to happen. And so, as they are eavesdropping into the heavens, it says that Allah subhanahu wa throws a meteorite at them, or this falling star that you see, or this blazing, fiery star that you see flying through the sky. Now remember, we are told to wish upon a star. I'm wishing on a star, wishing on a star. They're going to star. Stop the law, stop the law. But according to the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that when you see the falling star or the shooting star, this is Allah throwing a dart or throwing a missile at the shayateen, at the jinn that are eavesdropping into the heavens. Now this jinn that is eavesdropping into the heavens. Now remember these jizz, they stack on top of one another. These jizz, they stack on top of one another. And this jinn that is eavesdropping, the last jinn, it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala burns this jinn up with this meteorite. Or he burns it with this burning uh, uh, missile. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi said, but before this jinn is annihilated by this fire, he relays the message of what he hears or what he heard of the angels in the heavens. <coughs> he conveys whatever he heard to the jinn that is below him. And that jinn below him relays the message to the jinn below him until it goes all the way down to the kahin, to the soothsayer. So thus, there may be some truth. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu <laughs> said, he said, yes, they will have one truth, but it will be mixed with 99 lies.
So they give you one truth, but it'll be mixed with 99 lies. Okay? So this is how these soothsayers or this Sylvia Brown, these people dealing, these psychics, and all of these people, they're dealing with the jinn. Oh, well, your dad, he told me to tell you, this is all lies. They're dealing with the jinn and they're talking to the jinn. These jinn that used to live in the time of your mama and daddy. Because the Prophet Muhammad some said, every person is appointed two jinn. So your two jinns that live with you all your life, you best bet that they released or gave information to the other jinns that are around. So these jinns, and they're whispering to these jinns, and this jinn is whispering to this, this soothsayer, and so now the soothsayer, he has or she has some type of information about your daddy or your mama or something about you. How did he or she get that information? She got that information from the jinn. Whatever gym that she uh, corresponds with, contacts with, that gym got in contact, whatever gym that was in contact with your daddy and your mama, and told that gym the information, and that gym gave the information to the soup set. That's how they do it. That's how they do it. That's the trick. Anyone dealing with uh, soup saying fortune telling, they deal with magic, and they deal with devil worship. According to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi anyone dealing with magic is supposed to be put to death. According to the old scripture and the laws of Moses, it says that the sorcerer is supposed to be put to death. Why? Because it's dealing with magic. Why? Because anything dealing with magic is dealing with the jinn. So again, we don't deal with no magic. We don't deal with no soothsaying. We don't deal with no fortune telling. No palm reading. No horoscopes. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that the stars they're used for three things. To tell the time for the seasons and for to guide you at night time. And that they are the weapons or the missiles of the shaitan. Anything other than that, they're not used for nothing, anything other than that. Not for no consolation, because I'm a Cancer, or I'm a Gemini, or no. He said they're to see, right, and to tell the time, and missiles for the share team. So again, we don't do no uh, superstitions in Islam. And then, also in Islam, magic is Haram. Whether it's good magic, white magic, or black magic. All magic is Haram in Islam. Allah tells us in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 of the Quran, talking about Harut and Marut and the angels and the kingdom of, of Solomon and Babylon, that anyone that deals with magic, they are kufar. That anyone that deals with magic, they will be in the hellfire. Allah talks about those who do magic to bring about, even to cause uh, a split or a divorce between a husband and wife, Allah subhanahu wa calls this a type of magic as well. Because you can blow on people. You can well, you can evil wish or out I you can evilize somebody or even talk something into existence. Right? This is magic. Right? You whispering on somebody, you're blowing on somebody. So Allah subhanahu wa tells us that even to be a those who bring about some type of uh divorce between a husband and wife, that this is considered magic as well. Again, anything given the magic is haram. Black magic, white magic. We don't play with no type of magic. This is haram. All over Islam, part of Tawi. In Islam, the Prophet Muhammad said that the angels do not enter a house that angels do not enter a house where there are pictures and dogs. The angels of Allah for the law, and you know the angels are where we get our, the angels are what bring, they bring the mercy of the law, they bring the rahmah, right? They bring the protection from the law for the law, or if he decreases, or he can say, be it is. But Allah for the law says, 
through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the angels do not enter a house where there are pictures or where there are dogs. An example, Galil or Pooh. There was one time when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was told by the angels of Bila and Salah that he was going to meet him at a certain time in his house. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was waiting and waiting and waiting and Jabril Alayhi Salaam never showed up. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi he walked outside. And once he walked outside, once he walked outside, he realized that the angel Jabril was outside. Or he was hovering over the house. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, you know, the real, what happened? I thought we were supposed to meet at a certain time. I thought you were going to meet me. We were going to have a, you know, we had a, a meeting. So, Jabir and Salah said, we angels do not enter into a house where there are pictures and dogs. And there was a dog underneath your bed. So, he said that the Prophet Muhammad went and he found a dog and the dog was put out the house. Very important because this is a norm here in America. We take pictures and put them all on the wall. This is Haram and Islam. <laughs> we do not put pictures on the wall. We do not draw pictures. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that it is Haram to draw anything that has a soul. That anyone that competes with Allah for the Lord on the day of judgment, Allah will ask that person everything that he drew. He will ask that person to breathe the roh, to breathe, to, to breathe the, the air or light into that thing. And surely they won't be able to, but then Allah will breathe, will breathe the roh into that thing that that person that drew, and that thing will be uh, made to come alive, and that thing will, will be the, uh, the means of a punishment for that person in the half hour. So if you're drawing the hope, if you're drawing this big old buff dude, if you're drawing some type of alien, you're drawing some type of creature, then understand me. According to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that on the day of judgment, that Allah will make that thing come to life. And that thing that you drew, that that thing, it will come to life and it will be your punisher in the hellfire. So in Islam, we don't draw pictures. We don't draw human forms. We don't draw anything that has life. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you wish to draw something, then draw something that doesn't have life, like the trees, the masjid, the sky, flowers, anything that doesn't have life, you can draw that, or architect, you know, structures, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Also, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, any statues, any pictures, or anything that are, uh, that are raised up to destroy them. So any statues, any uh, relics, or things that are molded out of clay, and they're just sitting around just, you know, the Prophet Muhammad was compared to destroy those or to deface those things. You have pictures on the wall of your house, take them down. You cannot even pray with those pictures. If you have pictures in your house, take them down off the wall, put them in a, a photo book, put them in a photo album or something. But you cannot have pictures on the wall. No pictures on the wall. No pictures of family members, no pictures of cats, no pictures of dogs, nothing that has a soul. No pictures of no butterfly, ladybug, caterpillar, horse, Anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Hadith. <coughs> if you walk towards Allah, He'll run towards you. If you walk towards Allah, He'll run towards you. Everything begins with one step. Everything begins with one step. Every journey begins with one step. So if I strive to be of the best in this thing, excuse me, bro, 
Excuse me, we talking, right? If we strive to be the best in this deen, if we strive to be the best of the Muslims, if we strive to implement the Sunnah, or we want Allah for the Lord to bless us in everything that we do and everything that's attached to us, then it must first start somewhere with one step. Understand that this is the first pillar of Islam, the Islamic Talib. So everything that I'm talking about, man, this is the first attribute of your being. No pictures, no horoscopes, no magic, no superstition. We got to start implementing those things into our life, otherwise we will not be successful. We, we, can't, we might as well not even think about jihad. We might as well not even think about salat. We might as well not even think about those extra things that we can't even uh, uh, focus on Kali and understand what it means to fear Allah and only Allah is the one that we have to obey. We won't even understand it yet. We won't. We won't understand discipline. We won't understand a God. We won't understand nothing unless we understand Kali. La ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Allah is the only authority. I bear witness that Allah is the only one that can lay down laws and regulations. I bear witness that Allah is the only lawmaker. Period. Allah said in the Quran, chapter 5, verse 44 through 47. And if you judge, I will be mad when you follow the regime. And if you judge by any other thing, if you judge by this, anything other than what was revealed by Allah, so far Allah. If you judge by anything other than the revelation or that which was, re- that which was revealed by Allah, so far Allah, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah, He said you will be at the Bali Me, the Fossil King, and the Kafirin. The wrongdoers, the evildoers, and the disbelievers. If you judge by any other book, any other thing, other than what Allah for the law has revealed, the Quran and the Sunnah will be a disbeliever. It don't matter what you say. It don't matter what you got on. It don't matter what you wear. It don't matter what your name is. It don't matter how much money you got. It don't matter how intelligent you are or thick you are. If you judge by any other judgment other than what Allah has revealed, the Quran and Sunnah, you will be a disbeliever. So everything that we do, again, this is part of Tawhi. Following the Sunnah, following the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of this is a part of Tawhi. But we're talking about the first part of the Shahada. La ilaha Allah. Allah is the law giver. So the Quran is the only criteria by the law. When we say la ilaha illallah, we say that the Quran is the only criteria between right and wrong. Capitalism is not, is not the thing. Democracy is not the myth. Capitalism is not the myth. Anything other than the Sharia, the Quran, and the Sunnah is bakhir. It is falsehood. And it is nothing compared to the truth of Islam. If we establish any other constitution, any other reality, any other structure other than the Sharia, then it is Haram and we fall out of that realm of Islam and we'll be at the Kafirin, period. La ilaha illallah. We say la ilaha illallah, we put our trust in Allah. We say la ilaha illallah, we say we put our trust in Allah, so what we're in Allah. We put our trust in Him because He is the one that's in control of everything. We put our trust in Him because He said, and if the whole world came to cause harm against you, but if the law for the law does not live for it, they will not be able to touch you. And if you wish to be saved, or you think that the law for the law will not cause you to die, right, you don't want to go to the battlefield, you don't want to go fight jihad. He said, man, it doesn't matter because it's just a creed, even if you are in your living room, the bathroom, if it's your time to go, you're going to go. This is the belief in the law. This is lying in the law. To understand that the law for the law is the control of all things. A law controls whether I'm going to die. A law controls whether I'm going to be successful. A law controls whether I, I have a mind. A law controls whether I'm of the disbelievers. So we ask it all the time. 
and put this in our prerequisite, inshallah. I'm going to go ahead and close up on this uh, subject right now, but this ain't it. Inshallah, we'll continue next week, or the next time we come together and talk about what does it mean to uh, believe in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so inshallah, if there's any questions, uh, we'll take some questions now. If not, then we'll close out inshallah. Are there any questions? Any questions for the sisters? Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Rabbil Alameen. Again, we say, Nahid Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah, the first pillar of Islam. We bear witness that there is no God but Allah. We bear witness that God is one. We bear witness that He is unseen. We bear witness that He is not a human being. We bear witness that Jesus is not God. We bear witness that Jesus is not the Son of God. We bear witness that God is not one of three gods. God is one. We bear witness that God is the Adam. Be it he was. We get ready to say God be it Jesus. Be it he was. We get ready to say God be it Adam out of no father or mother. We get ready to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jesus with just a mother and he said be it he was. This is the reality. We get ready to say Allah is God. We get ready to say Jesus is just a prophet. We get ready to say he was just a messenger and a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll talk about that another day, inshallah. But be it this oppressive, inshallah, will flow down, inshallah. سبحانك اللهم وبارك فيك وما شاء الله أنت بتخلق بتبلك تعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وبسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خصر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتباصوا بالحق وتباصوا بالصبر وسبحانك اللهم وبارك فيك وما شاء الله أنت بتخلق بتبلك ورستقبل الله الذي لا إله إلا هو لقيم وتبلك ورحمة الله رب العالمين آمين